Good morning and welcome back to Life Changers International Ministries here in Yokosuka, Japan. I'm a Dr. Apostle Tahoma Anderson and I am the overseer here at Life Changers International Ministry. Our senior apostles are Apostles Jill and Shonda Kirk. They are the founders of Life Changers International Ministry here in Yokosuka, Japan and also in Life Changers Ministries, International Ministries in California. Now we welcome you back. We are grateful for those of you that are joining us today and have been following us. If you know someone that this ministry will be a blessing to, please share the information. We will be glad to have them. For those of you that do not have a church home and you feel connected to Life Changers International Ministries and you are being fed, meaning that the Word of God is impacting and changing your life, we do have a local ministry that is also a part of Life Changers International Ministry that you can be a part of. And to find out more about that, all you need to do is go into www.lifechangersim.com and you can learn more about it there. Or you can send us an email at lifechangersglobalm at yahoo.com and you can learn more about us and let us know what you want to do. So for our global partners, these are our announcements for the upcoming events and uh, opportunities you have to worship with us and worship with those that we are partnered with. So uh, the 25th through the 26th of October in San Francisco in the Bay Area, uh, Prophet Tanika Hill, a powerful woman of God, uh, is having a conference and uh, we have sponsored some people that are in the area. If you need a place to get this contact, uh, Apostle, uh, excuse me, Prophet Tanika Hill or Apostle Shawnee, and we will let you know where the location is of that conference and be a part of it. Get out, get the word of God, Get your breakthrough, get your healing, get your deliverance, and get that new fire burning in your spirit to do even greater works than what you're doing now. 10 through 16 December, Apostles Jill and Shonda Kirk, myself, and another member of the church will also be going into Kenya, Africa. Uh, God has blessed us with the vision of LCIM to establish not only a school there, but also to buy the land and the building to uh, meet the needs of 70 students that uh, we have been sponsoring for over seven years. It started out with our apostles sponsoring the children and then we caught the vision and have all began to sow into the mission in Kenya. And now this is the next the level that God has taken us into. So all those of you that have chosen to partner with us, that have been sowing your seeds and donations that help us reach our goal of $15,000 to purchase this land and establish the school, we are grateful for you. And we have uh, uh, we declare a decree a hundredfold on all your blessings and return in the name of Jesus. Uh, March 20th, uh, tw excuse me, March of 2020, we will also be going into South Africa. The dates are tentative now. We will give you more update once we do have the dates secured. And the uh, 10th of April through the 18th of April, Apostles Joe and Shonda Kirk will be visiting LCIM in Japan. We will be having a service here. We've already started putting out the flyer, so if you're in the area, please do come. If you're not in the area and you want to be a part, let us know so we can help you with the areas to find good uh, lodging and opportunities for you. And then also the 19th to the 24th of April of 2020, we will be going uh, from LCIM, members of LCIM will be going on to Philippines missions trip. You are all welcome to attend. If you would like to know more information, please send us an email at lifechangersglobalm at yahoo.com to find out more. Um, because we are already in a process where we're sending in our applications. Uh, we've already started putting down our deposits and uh, we will give you information about the total cost of that trip if you email us if you are interested in going. Every Sunday at LCIM, whether it be in California or here in Japan, there is ministry. If on the first Sunday of each month in Japan, we go out and we minister in the streets of Japan doing evangelism. Every Tuesday, except for the third Tuesday in Japan, LCIM, we do a version of a fellowship discipleship group. On that third Tuesday of the month, we go out and we do ministry by feeding the hungry. We feed 50 homeless people each month. Your donations, your tithes, and your offerings is what goes forth to help us provide those meals, hot meals, for the people here in Yokosuka, Japan, that are less fortunate than us. 
and every Thursday. Now that LCI in California is in their new building, they will be holding the Encouraging Discipleship Bible Study or Marriage Enrichment courses on their Thursday night services. So if you were in the uh, 29 Palms area, please go out, get the Word of God, get what God has released for you in this season. And, you know, it's so amazing to be a part of Life Changers International Ministry because we have something for everyone. We have uh, a church that is fasting and praying and it is meeting the needs of the people. We are a church that believes in feeding the hungry, a church that believes in evangelism, a church that believes in meeting the needs of our safe, single, and not ashamed members. We have fearfully and wonderfully made women's group prayer meetings and outings. We also have women encouraging women. Uh, prayer groups and outings. We have men encouraging men, prayer groups and outings. And we also have marriage enrichment. And it's a blessing to have the ability and the leadership to be able to administer these type of trainings and teachings. And it's all part of the body of Christ in LCIM. So we welcome you. Those concludes our announcements. We're grateful for you. And please continue to be a part of what we are doing. Yes, we spread the gospel, reaching the nations, impacting lives one person at a time. We are grateful for you. Thank you. So as we get ready to transition into our morning worship service, please grab your Bibles with me as we begin to do our uh, Bible uh, confession of faith. This is my Bible. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I am a believer, not a doubter. I walk by faith and not by sight. I walk by faith and not by sight. I will be taught the word of faith today. I will talk the word of faith today. And my life shall be greater. And my life shall be greater. I declare people are coming. I declare people are coming. From the north. From the north. The south. The south. The east. The east. And the west. And the west. And they're coming to be healed. They're coming to be healed. Delivered. Delivered. Set free. Set free. And hear the word of God. And hear the word of God. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's give God some praise. <laughs> being 
either widowed or orphaned because remember the church is considered the bride of Christ. So, and we're not orphaned. That doesn't mean that because we have a spiritual father that will be there for us, so we are not orphaned. You know, and we're not in slavery anymore. Christ purchased our freedom with his blood that he shed on Calvary. So that is how Christ is our kinsman and redeemer. And now we're going to take a look at David, the life of David. I'm so excited. You know, God was downpouring some things into me last night and early this morning. And the prayer has been off the chain. And I'm just so excited. The anointing is so strong. But when it talks about the intimate relationship and why am I so excited? Because I was seeing how my intimate relationship, my prayer life, my fasting life is now being uh, revealed in a different dimension of what it has been before. That, you know, whenever things are coming to attack myself or my family, my first response is not, woe is me, it's not, uh, how are we going to make it through this? But uh, we put on our word cry and we begin to travail in the spirit and we begin to pray in the spirit and we begin to call those things that are trying to come against us and we make it, uh, we take away its authority. And how do we do that? We take away its authority because the word of God says that every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord. He also, when Christ died and gave us the Holy Spirit, he gave us authority in his son Jesus' name to speak to those things that are not in call them to come forth. But he also gave us the authority and dominion over the, to rule over this earth. So we take authority over every demonic principality and so we begin to cast those things down through the word of God. We profess the word of God and we allow it to work on our behalf because the word of God has to do the thing that it is sent to do. It performs the work that we send it to do. And that's important for us to have that intimate relationship with the word of God so that when trials and tribulations come, we can speak the word. Even when uh, Christ was... Uh, in his 40 day fasting and he was up on the mount the enemy tried to tempt him and tried to use the word to manipulate the word when you're in the word and you're studying in the word the enemy cannot manipulate it with, uh, against you because the Holy Spirit will bring revelation to you and you'll be able to identify what is not correct with the word and you will be able to use the word to tear down the strongholds and tear down the temptations and tear down the vain imaginations that the enemy is trying to project onto you. So as we look at uh, the life of David, we're going to look at how that type of relationship, that intimacy, because he knew God and he had developed a relationship with God that he was now protecting and defending the honor of God. You know, God tells us that uh, he is our defense. He's given us victory over all things, right? He's already won the victory. He's already fought. Only thing that we have to do is stay in position and stay in a posture of prayer and stay in a posture of worship and stay in a posture of praise that when we are under our trials and tribulation that the enemy is confused and begins to scatter because our focus is not on the things that the enemy is using to, to come against us, but it is on what God has put in us that is now coming out of us that is causing the enemy to run. We looked at how Jephthah was able to win, how he made a valley, he was able to win. We looked at how Gideon was raised up, you know, the most unlikely candidate to lead the people, but how God gave him wisdom on how to approach the enemy, and the enemy got scattered and turned on itself. And when we get into a place of worship and prayer, that's what happens. The enemy gets scattered because we're not giving him leeway or room to operate in our lives. So when we look at the book of 1 Samuel and 17, we see the story of David already in place. We start to see where the children of Israel have not accepted God as their king. They rejected God as their king. They wanted somebody because they didn't see it naturally happening. They wanted someone to come in and be king over them that they could see, that they could touch. They wanted a tangible king. So what did God do? He gave them what they asked for. He gave them a man that fit the 
structure or the statue or what they felt like should be king. So that was Saul. What was different about Saul than the other people was that Saul was actually taller than the other men and the women in that area. So he had the structure or the body structure that struck um, or made people think about prominence. So he was raised up as king. But the problem with Saul was that Saul was greedy. He was jealous and he was selfish. And he had no reverence of God. He did not have a heart for God or doing a, a heart to do God's work. So what was happening? Any time that you put or raise up something or someone and make it a God in your life or a king in your life, give it kingdomship in your life, what happens is that kingdom will fall. Remember, all kingdoms will bow down to the kingdom of God, our heavenly uh, father, right? Yeah. So Saul's kingdom was falling. It was on the verge of collapse. He was not a great leader because he was so self-consumed. And now the children of Israel are looking at this is supposed to be our king. Our king is supposed to lead us and supposed to protect us. Our king is supposed to be the promise of what the Messiah is said to be in the word. So why are we in this situation? They're in that situation because they rejected what God had promised them because they did not see it in the natural. So their natural visual pers uh, perspective caused them to see things that were only in the flesh instead of being able to receive and be patient to wait for what was released in the spirit and it's appointed time to get there. So the children of Israel were still looking for the promise to be fulfilled of the king that was set on the throne and yet because they didn't see the king as what it was promised because Saul did not fit the bill. Then they were starting to see that they were constantly in place where they were in constant war or constantly being overtaken and constantly being um, oppressed. But these were the children of promise, so how can they constantly be in a state of oppression and a state of depression and a, a state of having something over them that has a stronghold or uh, keeping them in a place where they cannot prosper? And that's because they gave up their inheritance when they rejected God as their king. And so, in order to get Israel to see what they have done, he had to expose what was in Saul. Right? God will always expose what is in you to bring healing and deliverance to you so that you can move forward and not be in a place that is holding you back from receiving your total promise, your total healing, your total deliverance. But the thing of it is, God is a gentle God. God is a, a God that honors and respects your free will. That he is never going to go against your will to either submit to him or not submit to him. But he will expose it. And it's up to you whether or not you allow God to show you these areas and then you repent and you surrender these areas so that God can move into your life and God can bring that healing and the deliverance. And now this weakness that you have is being turned around and becoming a strength because this is no longer a thorn in your side and it's no longer a tool that the enemy or a wedge that the enemy can use to keep you out of the presence of God. Some of us have many uh, items or idols that we have in our lives that we have made in our lives that are keeping us from being truly in a place where we can get into the presence of God. Sometimes we fill up our schedule so much that we don't have time to go in and be in God's presence because we got to rush to the next thing after work or we got to rush to the uh, meeting or we got to go here and that. We get ourselves caught up in so many social events that we have no time to have intimacy with God. And by the time we get up in the morning, then we set our alarm clocks to where we have no schedule in there, no time. And I know I've been guilty of this. I get up so late sometimes that I don't have time to get into the presence of God before I go to work. So I say I'll do it in the evening, and then in the evening something always pops up, and then you go, I'm tired. 
But we got to learn to put God in a position where he belongs and keep him there first as our first priority, as our first love. And so these are some of the things that God is calling us to do. He's calling us that we will yield to his calling so that we can change our weaknesses to strengths and that we can be free from strongholds and bondages that are the things that are hindering us from moving in his calling, moving in his purpose, and moving in his glory. Remember, God wants to take us from glory to glory. Yes. So in order for God to expose what was in King Saul, he raised up something that was bigger than King Saul. So that the people of Israel would see that Saul was not the man that they thought he was. At one point, the Israelites were so oppressed that the only people that had swords to defend themselves was King Saul and his son Jonathan. Everybody else only had the, um, the tools. I mean, they had victory at first against all the... Um, the ites, the Moabites, and uh, these other ites that was in the area, they had victory over them because they were on the same fighting field. They were on the same way of fighting. But then they run against the Philistines, which were sea people, and they had something totally different as weaponry. So they were fighting with swords, and they were fighting with arrows and, and different things that the people of Israel didn't have because they weren't in that area where it was a requirement for them to have those type of things to survive. So it's imperative that when you go into battle, you have the right equipment. That's why it's important for us to know that um, our battle strategy changes with the enemy that we come against. So in 1 Samuel 13, 19 through 22, we see that at one point, you know, I was talking about the tools that they had where Solomon and Jonathan are the only two that had the weapons, right? Yeah. The real weapons to fight and war against. Everybody else had farm tools. So you can't go into battle ill-equipped. So what do I mean by this? Every believer has to have some type of prayer life. If you don't have prayer, you don't have power. You can't get power just from saying uh, and citing things over and over. But the power comes from the intimacy because unless you know how to operate the vehicle, let's just use keys, right? The key is powerful. When it's connected to the switch that has the energy ignited in it, you turn it and it's able to move a vehicle. But the key alone has no power until it's connected to a source that will allow it to operate in its purpose. We as believers have the key called prayer, a key called fasting. But we can't operate in it if we're not willing to get into the Word and get revelational knowledge on a divine impartation from the Holy Spirit on how to move in our strategic warfare because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against principalities. That means that our war is not in the natural, but it's in the spiritual. But sometimes the world that has been released in the natural, excuse me, in the spirit realm, is starting to manifest in the natural realm. So we try to appease the symptoms in the natural, but we really need to be warned in the spiritual. But if we don't have an intimate relationship with God through the word of God, because we haven't been fasting and we haven't been praying and we haven't been reading our word, we're only getting a small drip or drop on Sunday enough to keep us at peace until Wednesday when we get into Bible study. If we're only doing it on Sunday, then we're depleted by the time Wednesday gets here and then we're trying to run on fumes. A car is on empty until the next following week. But all through the week we're being battled and, and torn and, and flopped around like we're in the middle of a hurricane because we do not know how to get into the presence of God because we're so focused on 
and the negative connotations of what's going on and the, the storm that we're in, instead of praising God for the rain that's washing away the debris. Instead of getting into a place where we're praising God for the rain that is bringing restoration to the land. We're focused on the problem instead of focusing on the God that is the healer, the deliverer. So, we're fighting this battle ill-equipped because we're fighting with our emotions and we're fighting with our flesh instead of fighting in the spirit realm. See, the more that we get into the word of God, then we get a fresh oil. The battles that we fought yesterday, those, the oil that we had, the grace will not cover us for today's battle. We need a fresh wine poured into our wine skin. We need a fresh anointing poured over us that will sustain us for today. And we need a fresh one for tomorrow. Because God is continually doing a new thing in us, so we need a new anointing, a new refreshing, refining to take us through that process. So our prayer life is what is equipping us to get there. You know, when the word of God tells us to put on the whole armor of God in Ephesians 6, right? And he's telling us to put on the whole armor of God. That means that we need to be in that prayer. We need to be able to identify because one thing about armor, and I will speak from the perspective of a former soldier, that we have all this equipment, and you know, it, it's, they make certain sizes. But when you get equipment that is tailor-made for your body type, then you're able to move and function in it as if it is part of your natural skin. And you are able to maneuver, and there is no hindrances. It's not overly bulky. It's, it's able to sustain you. It fits properly, so it protects you completely. When we get into the presence of God and we get into that fasting and prayer life and we get into that personal study that shows us to ourselves approved that we can rightly divide the word of God, then we're getting that tailor-made armor. Remember, I talked about in 1 Samuel 13, 19, and 22, at one time the only people that had the proper equipment to battle was Saul and Jonathan. Well, Saul had tailor-made armor. It was custom-made to his body composition. So, he was six foot, or almost, he was over six foot or, or taller. Don't quote me on the exact height, but I know he was over six feet, he was big. So, you know, his body structure was something that was strong. So someone my size trying to put on his armor will look totally awkward in it. I couldn't function. I couldn't move because it would be too weighty. It would be too bulky. It would be too, uh, it would not protect my vital organs because it was not tailored for me. It was tailored for someone else. That's what happens when we're depending on someone else's prayer to take us through. Instead of getting into the process and getting into the vein and getting to the presence of God, we're always depending on our pastor to pray for us or our mama to pray for them. Mama and them can't get us into the kingdom of heaven. They can't stand on the day of judgment for us. But it's what we do in our own lives that is what we have to give an account for. And that's the importance of having that prayer life and getting that intimacy. You know, I'm trying to drive home, if you haven't caught it yet, intimacy. You know, why am I wearing, because I love Under Armour stuff, but I'm wearing Under Armour, and I choose to wear Under Armour all the time because I am constantly under the armor of God. It represents something totally different for me. But it is a subliminal message to other people and anything that's trying to rise up against me demonically that I'm under armor. You may not see it physically, but I'm under the armor of God. I have the bright of righteousness. I have this word of the Spirit called the Word of God. And God has given me 
knowledge on how to rightly divide the word of God and that I can impart it into someone else. That they will glean wisdom from it. And that they will raise up and be able to ignite a courageous faith inside of them. That they will be able to take the word of God when they're meeting the rubber to the road and their trials and tribulations. And they'll begin to have a faith confession over the word of God and begin to speak the word over their life. And begin to prophetically bring themselves out of the, the process that they're in because they're getting into a place and a posture of worship and praise that is going to cause the enemy to be scattered because they're confused. And you know, why is this person not losing their mind when I'm sending all these things that will cause them to lose their mind, but yet they keep trying to tell me that the word of God is this and that. The key to this is, you can know the word of God, you can read it. But if you don't have comprehension, you just read some words. Until you allow it to become a part of who you are, a part of your psyche, a part of your uh, character, and you allow this word to mold you and, and make you into the image of Christ, then guess what? You still don't have power because until you connect with the word of God and it becomes life to you, which the word of God is the bread of life, then guess what? Until you begin to eat those meals of the word of life, then you're not being able to uh, be sustained. You are spiritually malnourished. But when you get into that prayer closet and you get into that fasting state of mind and you get into the presence of God where you're setting aside that intimate time with him that he can pour into you, that you're not distracted by the cell phone, you're not distracted by the kids running around, you're not distracted by who's on TV or what's playing, but you get into that quiet place where the Lord can actually have you one-on-one -on -one and impart into you, then guess what happens? You begin to disarm the weaponry of the enemy that has been set to destroy you. See, we have two things going on. The enemy is constantly, as we talk about in Ephesians 6 and 12, we are wrestling not against the flesh and blood. Our conflict is not with man who are denoted by flesh and blood, which is usually a symbol of weakness, therefore denoting that our opponents are not weak mortals. But powers of far and more formidable order, but against the principalities, against the powers of Satan, right? Yeah. There are different demonic levels, just like there is different levels of power in our government system. There is different demonic levels of power in the uh, demonic system. There is archangels in the heavenly system. There are cherubim. There are different levels of authority of angelic hosts that we have at our fingertips to release to war on our behalf. But unless we have a relationship with God, we will never know those things. And we can't just take the word of somebody else. But when you begin to operate in the spirit realm and you begin to call down these things and you begin to release you know, when you bind up, you got to release something. When you bind up something here on earth, it's bound in heaven. But when you release something here on earth, it's also released in heaven. So when you bind up something, there has to be a release. Do you not know that Satan is continually and constantly undermining, undergirding the authority of God because the people of God are perishing because of their lack of knowledge on how to war in the spirit. Satan is constantly disarming every believer because he has begun to manipulate their life through a series of distractions and mental manipulations that is causing them to neglect their prayer life, to neglect their fasting life, and therefore they have no power to combat against him and his demons. Some of us think that we are warring against these huge demonic high level demons and we only play with them. Why? Because we have no power and no authority in us and the devil knows our intimate relationship with God and he does not fear the God that's in you. But woe unto that demonic force that is coming against those remnants that God is raising up that is on the prayer wall and getting up at the midnight hour 
and getting up at the third hour and they're getting in that prayer life and they're being consistent that it's getting in that global co uh, corporate prayer and getting in a, a connection with the body believers and believe and know the appointed assignment that we have in this season and we're beginning to raise war against the war that has been raised on us and we're beginning to stand up like David did and we're releasing a war cry that is, is terrorizing hell the way that hell has been terrorizing the children of God and the children of Israel for centuries. But we have the power to stop the enemy because we have already been given the victory. We just have to hold to the standard. And when we hold to the standard, guess what? We want to be like this. We understand that our God has no living. The living God, the God of Israel, the God Jehovah, Je uh, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Sanu, he has no limits. El Shaddai has no limits. <laughs> we limit God because of our lack of faith. We limit God because of our lack of belief in what he said is true. Because the enemy has released so much propaganda against us through the spirits of Leviathan and the spirit of Bohemian that are attacking the seven areas of our Christian life. They're doing it through religion. They're doing it through the family. They're doing it through our government social systems. And we're falling into this trap that we have no power. But if we were as... as Oh, Jesus. If we were as determined as some of these religious bohemian spirits that has been released in this time to bring forth change that is abomination to the word of God into our schools and into our workplaces and into our governments, that's stripping everything of God out of the atmosphere so it can wreak havoc in it. If we as Christians will be bold as David and see that this is coming against the God of our, the living God, then it's trying to just uh, give him a bad reputation, but yet we're saying that we're walking in his image. If we will begin to take a stand, then guess what? None of it will ever infiltrate. It will never have infiltrated our schools. It would have never infiltrated our jobs. But the children of God, those that are called, that call themselves the church, have become lax. They have allowed the enemy to disarm them because they have a lack of prayer, they have a lack of fasting, and they have a lack of vision for the word of God. See, our God doesn't require weapons. He doesn't even require a human body. He chooses to use us because he takes the foolish things of the world to conform to wise. He takes the less likely person, the person that man has written off as being unholy, unacceptable, and being a throwaway or being a, what is it, a castaway, unwanted, undesirables. God is using each one of those people and he's raising them up as, as a, a prophet. Tanika Hill says, emerging voices in this season because guess what? The God in us will not be denied because we are not going to set back and allow just anything to go. What we're going to do is get on our knees. We're going to get into that fast and we're going to get into the power of agreement with someone else that is a like-minded believer and we're going to walk according to Amos 3 and 3 in the word together and then we're going to put down the prayer strategies that the Holy Spirit is releasing into us and we're going to get on this war cry and we're going to get on the wall and we're going to release the angels, the legions of angels to war and crush on our behalf to destroy and tear up every demonic influence that is wreaking havoc in the regions that we have been placed. And then we're going to bind up every rebellious spirit, every retaliation spirit that tries to attack us and our seed. Because we're going to release our protecting angels. But guess what? If no one had ever discipled us, we would not know how to be on the battlefield for the Lord. We would not know how to
to execute our power and our authority that we've been given in Jesus' name. See, we have delegated authority to use Jesus' name. That, that same respect that was given to the name of Jesus, that every knee shall bow, every tongue confess. When we use the word of Jesus, the name of Jesus, every demon shall bow and submit to the authority of God that he has placed on our life. How did we get there? We got there through fasting. We got there through praise. We got there because we developed a warrior's heart inside of us. Because we have a God that is so good to us that we want to be on the battlefield. We want to fight the good fight of faith. And we want to run to the end just like Timothy. We want to live our life poured up. We want to live our life this impact and change even unto death like Christ if necessary. But the only way that we got here and got that passion and got that zeal, got that fire of God burning so strong in us is because we got into that, that secret place. We got into that private closet and we got in before the Lord and we travailed in prayer. We cried out to the Lord, Lord, change me, Lord, fix me, Lord, deliver me, Lord, heal me. Lord, remove this from me. We got into a place and a posture of repentance in our spirit, man, so that we can be purged of everything that is unpleasing to God, so he can pour in everything that is of his spirit, of his nature, of his mind, of his heart, that we can go out and release it into a world that's dead and dying. That they will know the hope of glory. Judges 3 and 31 says, God raised up Sh Shamagar, the son of Enoch, to defeat the Philistines with an ox gold. He killed 600 Philistines. And the purpose of this was to show that the men of Judah had been brought at a time by their oppressor. But he was able to say to Israelites, the oppressor will try to destroy you. But guess what? God always raises up one that will show you how to be delivered, how to operate. And once again, the Philistines had, had taken over and had wreaked havoc against the children of promise. And in Judges 15 and 15, Samson killed a thousand Philistines with a jawbone of an axe or a donkey for the people that want to keep it in the children version. So, why am I talking about all these people? They were common people. And God used common people to do an uncommon thing. You were a common person and God wants to use you in an uncommon way. But he needs for you to get into the posture where he can use you to fight the Goliaths in your life. Where he can use you to fight the Goliaths this within your family bloodline. That he can use you to break and destroy the curses that is on your family bloodline. That it stops with you because of the obedience of you walking with it. And you can take that curse and declare that it go back. 20 or 40 generations and not return and then declare and decree that every blessing that was hindered from being released because of disobedience now be released in your bloodline now and be manifested now in the name of Jesus. See, many of us bought into the line that we are not enough or we're not good enough to be used by God. That our life was so torn, ratchet, whatever, that God couldn't save us. We had listened to people that were so religious that told you that if you didn't do 15 Hail Marys and or jump around the church and fall out like this and slobber and, and basically all this, that you weren't saved. And that's a lie from the pits of hell. And that comes from people not understanding the word of God because they haven't studied it or showed themselves a proof that they don't know that it takes just believing that Christ is the Son of God who was raised from the dead and he has bought us with a price. That we believe on him. The enemy has 
put us in a place of fear that because we don't have an official title or we don't have a label stuck on us that we don't have the authority or the ability to spread the gospel. And that's a lot. We have the ability to spread the gospel and share our testimony throughout the land. It doesn't require a title. It doesn't require a piece of paper for you to share the gospel uh, on your job and share your faith with someone. The word of God tells you many are called, but few are chosen. Not everyone is chosen to stand in a pulpit or to go into the nation. Everyone is chosen, though, for a, a appointed place, an appointed time, where we rightly impart to somebody or somebody imparts into us to bring about a change in our life that will cause us to get the zeal of God to operate and move in our life. A lot of us have had the enemy whisper in our ears so long, so much negativity and so much fear that we become paralyzed spiritually and we will not operate spiritually out of fear that we're doing it wrong. But the Holy Spirit is your correction. The Holy Spirit is the one that will lead you. The Holy Spirit is the one that will instruct you with God's eye in the way that you should go. But if you don't have an intimate relationship that you have developed by being intimate in the Word of God, taking time to understand the Word of God and getting into His presence, you will never know it. So you probably wonder, what did all that have to do with David? <laughs> See, David's father, when we get over here to um, 1 Samuel, we're around 1 Samuel 13. David was sent on an assignment from his father. I want you to key on the word sent, okay? Because God gave me some revelations about this. David was being sent by his father to take nutrition to the battlefield for his brothers. I'm going to say it again. David was sent by his father to the battlefield to deliver nutrition to his brothers. There are so many of us that is being sent by our Father, God, on the battlefield in this world, in different regions, different cities, different nations, different towns, different homes, different families, to bring nutrition to the battlefield of the mind and the hearts of the people. See, when David arrived at the location where his brothers were, they are already around the 80th, they had already passed 80 days of being taunted and, and tortured by a giant called the Lion. Challenging them constantly to send someone out to war against him. And everybody was looking at, I don't have the ability to do it. Even you think about this big army of people, but yet no one was brave enough to go out and fight against Goliath because they see him as being someone that can just step on me and destroy me immediately. Some of us allow the demonic strongholds and Jezebel spirits on our jobs to make us feel like we don't have a voice to speak out, to defend ourselves. And so you go through a lot of uh, hardships because of that. But at the time that David arrived at this location, it's on day 81, when he arrived there, the army had been robbed up and they're all running and they're doing this war cry. And here's this 17 year old boy, David, and he's beginning to run along the side of them. If you can imagine, he's running along the side of them and he's engaging in the war cry.
The difference between David and the people he was running alongside of until he found his brothers, they were running afraid. They were doing a war cry. They were running afraid, and they refused to engage. Even David's brothers refused to engage out of fear. See, the enemy will let you rage up, and you can confess everything, but if you don't have that intimate relationship where you know you operate in power, then you're just saying words to a demon. David sat back laughing. He ain't even working because you're working against yourself. The crazy thing was that God started giving me revelation. This is what is reflective of the church today. We're out here, we're praising, we're screaming, we're dancing and hopping around, but nobody is truly engaging in the warfare of prayer, except for the remnant that God is raising up right now. Everybody is trying to be on this, that, and the other and get their name famous, but nobody is trying to be engaged in the warfare that is trying to save the souls anymore. They lost focus on the purpose. Their perspective is off. But if we as a church would get back in our proper place and posture of prayer and fasting, we would develop a level of intimacy that healing will begin to come into the land. When you think about how powerful Paul's intimacy was with Christ, that even his shadow healed the sick. I declare that over my life. That the anointing of God be so powerful that even when a person comes in contact with me, that the demonic influence on their life has to break off. That any sickness, any illness that is there has to fall off in the name of Jesus. The healing virtue go immediately into that body. But how can I sit here and declare that? Because I've gotten into the word and I know that this is something that God said, that greater work shall I do. The way he did. So guess what? This is something he did so I can do greater. And how can I do greater? Because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I know my spiritual identity. I know my level of intimacy with God. And I decided long ago, no more spiritual compromising. See, the church has begun to compromise and that's why they can't raise up the standard. That's why they're afraid to speak out. Because too many of the church leaders, because of fame and fortune, has connected themselves with demonic entities that they can't even raise up and be taken seriously anymore because of their affiliation. They're no longer affiliated with the Word of God. They're affiliated with the, the connections and the names of people. Prosperity. It's not bad when you're getting it from the source that has ordained it to be in your life. But when you go out to get it because of pleasing men or through uh, pleasing men and, and compromising your spiritual integrity to be there to get it, it's something totally different. The church needs to rise up. It needs to repent. It needs to renew the vision that God has given for their visual perspective which is to win souls from the kingdom of heaven. To bring people out of the darkness into God's marvelous light, according to 2 Peter 3. The church needs to understand that when you've got a relationship with God, He's a God that will not be denied. He's a God that is jealous. He will not have any other God before him. He's a God that is always victorious, and we walk victorious in him. But we have to stop trying to save face for people to be like the Joneses. We need to be transparent because people don't believe that God is real until they see him move in your life. There are so many people that follow me today that knew me back then. Only because they can see the transition that God made in my life. And they can see that it's real. They can see the healing from the past hurts. They can see the deliverance from the past sins. They can see the lifestyle change. They can see the change in the conversation. And they can see a change in the walk. We as 
was mentioned to me earlier today when we were in prayer, things that God is revealing and wanting us to do. We should get into a posture of prayer that we should be a beacon of light on whatever community that we're set into. That the God that's in us is so much and a magnet and truth that people are going to be drawn and they want to know what you got. So how can I get it? Because I need to have what you got. People will begin to declare and prophesy into your life the things that they see in you, even though it's not truly manifested because of how you conduct yourself, because the glory of God will be so strong on your life because of the intimacy that you have gotten into his presence with. That everything that speaks of God and his fullness thereof is reflected in operation in your life. So back to David. David had a different visual perspective when this war crop was going on. It wasn't about the adrenaline rush or running next to all these armies of, of people and his brothers and, and crying out and showing that they were strong. It wasn't about that. He was raging a war cry because he knew he served a God that was victorious. He was raising a war cry because he had faith in the ability of his God to sustain him in dangerous situations. You have to remember that when you have been a part of, and some of us have this in their lives and some of us don't, when you've been a part of a family that has been through hell and high waters and gone to tribulations, and when I say demonic attack after demonic attack, when you've seen families that have had suffered murder and suffered death and had people that have been molested and people that have been uh, raped and you have people that have been uh, held back, people that have been wrongly accused, and yet they still choose to serve God and they overcome and they walk with their head high. It's because the power of God and the intimate relationship is that not am I persecuted, but the God in me is being persecuted. Not am I being attacked, but the God in me is being attacked. And because I love God and I know that my God is a sustainer, my God is a keeper, I'm going to walk this walk. Regardless of what mouth is raising up against me, God will silence it. Then you get to that place of intimacy where it doesn't matter what's being said about me. But I'm going to walk according to what my God is leading me to walk in. I'm going to endure the good fight like Timothy. David's perspective was this. He was provoked to his purpose because the giant spoke against his God. He went to defend the word of his God. See, David's intimate relationship with God demanded a representation of God to put the proper perspective back in place. The proper perspective that God was not a God that will bow down to any other God. God is not a God that will ever be defeated. The perspective that God is always victorious. The perspective that God is who he is and he can take the foolish things of this earth to conform the wise is what is spoken of in 1 Corinthians 1 and 27. So what did he do? We talked about the jawbone of the ass being used by Samson. We talked about the ox goat that was used by um, Shechemar. So guess what David did? And all his little youth and aspiration, and he said, I'll fight the lion. There's so many Goliaths in our lives that are attacking us, and everybody wants to cower down, but it takes somebody that God raises up in your family that's going to say, you know what, I'm going to fight. I'm going to fight for my family. I'm going to fight for my marriage. I'm going to fight for my healing. I'm going to fight for my deliverance. I'm going to fight for my child that is on drugs. I'm going to fight on my knees. I'm going to fight in prayer. I'm going to fight by turning down my plate. See, everybody else was focused on 
the possibility of how the giant could kill them. But David was, was focused on the, how God was going to protect him. See, David understood that no harm can come near my, me or my dwelling. David had faith in his God's ability to sustain him. God's ability to protect him. God's ability to defend himself. But God, uh, that God and David will not allow Goliath to continue to tarnish the reputation or the provocation of a God or someone that didn't know or worship him. David wasn't happy. See, so often everybody else was depending on their equipment. They were depending on their armor. And I, I love what one of my friends said to me last night when we were talking about ministry and going forth is that Jesus walked on this earth and ministered for a period of 12 years or three years and he never had any type of armor or protection. He just had the power and the protection of God and the Holy Spirit. He had the warring angels to protect against him. Right? We have been so programmed to be a uh, walk and operate in a spirit of fear that we don't trust God to protect or defend us anymore. But when you think about situations like a plane crash that just happened last week and all the people on the plane got off and they were okay, somebody on that prayer, on that plane, covered them in prayer. They believed that their God would save them. When you look at some of the other tragedies that happen, when you see these people that walked away and God gave them a word not to get on the plane or God gave them a word not to go into the building, you know that God is a God that still protects. The same God back then is the same God that we have now. And see, there, David didn't trust in the equipment. David trusted in God. When Saul tried to give him the ill-fitting equipment and others tried to give him the ill-fitting equipment, he could not sustain it. He would be lost in the battle. But people that don't know how to worship God, don't know how to worry God, are so quick to come to your defense to try to help you do what they're not willing to do. So they give you some type of ill-equipped advice or ill-equipped equipment to help you lose the battle. But if you take up the whole armor of God, and you take up the word of God, and you put it on for yourself, you'll be able to withstand the wiles of the enemy. You'll be able to stand the fiery darts. You will be able to identify and discern every spirit that's coming against you. And once you are able to identify it, then you know how to com combat it because you can call those things down. You can... <laughs> Make his power null and void. You have the ability through the word of God, through the name of Jesus, to strip every demonic power from it. But no one's trained you, so you're ill-equipped. You haven't studied your word because you're depending on some man to give it to you. And so then what happens is now you're in a state of bondage because you don't know how to war in the spirit. Because you're not going to your Bible study. And you're not going to church on a regular basis. You're putting everything else as a priority. And so now you're having to learn the lessons the same way that the children of Israel is learning the lessons. That these things I've been holding against you or holding up from you. But now that you don't want to follow me, they're going to start to follow you. See... David taught us a valuable lesson that most believers miss or misunderstand. And that is that no one else's armor can protect us like our own. Right? Nobody else's equipment can protect us like our own. Mothers, we can cover our children only up to a certain point. But when they become of, of age, then our ours is only a, a prayer of protection. But our own prayers, when we get in that fasting, can defend off. And then when we get into that corporate prayer and that connecting together and that prayer of agreement, then we put in some serious battlefield wartime in. See, oftentimes in our lives, we are taunted 
like the children of Israel was by Goliath, by the things of our past. People try to use those as strongholds over us to tell us that we're not good enough to be used in the kingdom of God. We have so many Christians that sit in a pulpit and say that they are of God, but still want to hold somebody accountable to the past, but yet God raised you and rinsed you clean. So how you can you hold someone else accountable? There's too many people that are sitting in a pulpit that have so much unforgiveness in their heart. So how can you expect God to forgive you if you can't forgive others? It's a time for the church to repent and get back into the rightful posture of studying the word of God and repenting and having a heart for the things of God and the people of God. See, David fought Goliath to defend the God of Israel and to protect Israel. The enemy tries to keep us in an emotional state. That we don't know our own strength. See, Goliath taunted the children of Israel in 1 Samuel 17 and 10. He taunted them so bad that they stayed in a state of fear. And they become so dependent and focused on his size and structure that they only see that he is too big to destroy. And David took on their perspective. He's too big not to miss. I just need the right tool. So what did he use? David didn't use the tools that everybody else used, but he used the tools that he was accustomed to operating in. Case in point, key point. <laughs> I love you, Holy Spirit. Key point. If you are not equipped to fight demons, don't bring up warfare to your home. Not everybody is called to cast out demons. We all have the ability to. It's by faith. If you don't have the faith to bring about healing or operate in the gift and anointing of healing, don't go lay hands on somebody declaring healing because you bring illness into your home. You open up portals. You have to know what your gifting is in the spirit and operate in it. Because when you try to operate outside of your anointing, you don't have the grace to cover you. See, David used what he had been equipped to use, that slingshot. And he took it and he reared it back and he released it. Because he had the grace and the mercy from God to release and use that tool. Our prayer and our fasting life and the anointing of God that's on us is that tool that gives us the power to release the fire of God, to release the healing virtue of God, to release the angels to war on our behalf, to release the angels of destiny. But if you don't have the intimate relationship with God, some of the things that you step into, you don't have grace to cover you. And then you go through more than what you ever should have went through. The enemy is constantly trying to keep us in a place of unstable, uh, stable mindedness, a place where we are double minded, so we are not stable in any of our ways. We're living a life of confusion, but God is not the honor, author of confusion. He's not. He's not the author of lies either. God is precise and He will give you direction and guidance. But in this season, this is what's happening. The warriors that are on the war cry, those emerging voices that are releasing a sound that is bringing a change and affecting a change in the demonic realm in the regions and the nations that God is placing his people in in the season, what he is doing, he's raising up an army of people. And this army of people have a heart of David, a servant's heart, but then they also have a heart that they're not going to let anything just be said about their God, but they're going to operate in the giftings of God to let you know that my God is real. My God is real. My God is a protector. He is my defense. I don't have to worry about somebody protecting my name or my reputation because God will silence every voice that's raised up against me. I don't have to worry about somebody accusing me of being in a cult because what God is releasing in the fire and the deliverance and the healing, that is God moving through his spirit. I'm just a conduit and it's a willing vessel allowing myself to be used by God. God is raising up people of faith that will give birth and become spiritual midwives to bring about breakthrough and change that will heal a nation 
and deliver a people that have been brought down by the Hena spirit and the Viking spirits because they've been focused on religious teaching and practices that have no life but death. God is raising up a people that will become an unstoppable movement, almost like a tsunami wave that is going to hit the nations by storm and release the fire of God that there will be thousands and millions of people that begin to come to Christ. There will be revival and healing in the land that is like no other, like nobody's ever seen. It's going to be greater than anything that happened in the Billy Graham movement because this is getting closer and drawing in the end time and God is releasing out his spirit and the people are going to start to grab a hold of the vision while they yet can. The reason why this emerging voices and this remnant that is moving is going to be so powerful is because they have an intimate relationship with God that they've gotten into his presence. They know the fear of the Lord has given them strong confidence according to Proverbs 14 and 26. They also know that his children have a place of refuge. So they don't have to worry about being on a battlefield because God is going to give them a place of peace and refuge. They know according to 2 Timothy 1 and 7 that God has not given them the spirit of fear but power and love and a sound mind. So they don't have to worry about the war that's raged against their mind because they have the authority and the power from their relationship with God through their intimate relationship that they can cast down and call down those vain imaginations. And they can declare that they have a sound mind. See, every believer has been given tools and resources that we need to defeat the enemy. That we have to sustain the victory. See, only thing that we're doing in this lifestyle is sustaining the victory that's already won. See, God sent Jesus to go out and take over the territory. Then he sent us in as forces behind to sustain and build up the people, to build them up in knowledge, to build them up in understanding, to build them up in their most holy faith, to give them spiritual confidence by giving them the word of God unadulterated, untainted, and teaching them how to learn the word for themselves, to develop that intimate relationship so that they can be strong and of good courage, that they will be able to withstand the, the trials and tribulations that come at hand. Romans 15 and 13 says, Now the God of hope fill you with joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. See, we have lost our peace and we have lost our power and we lost our hope because we are not being sustained by the Holy Ghost. We're being sustained by our vain imaginations. We're being sustained by our emotions instead of being sustained by the Word of God. And you wonder why you, you don't have power. Every story that we have listened to over this last few months, every trial and tribulation that the people of God went through in the Old Testament is so correlated to what people are going through in today's society and now. And what it is, we miss the point that every person had triumph over triumph. Every person looked at the situation. There was times when the children of Israel was headed for inevitable destruction and then God stepped in. When we open up the door for God to move in our life, the things that should annihilate us and take us out, God will give us a way of an escape, and we avoid the annihilation. But God is calling us to a place, and he's raising up the Jonas, he's raising up the Joshua's, he's raising up the Caleb's, and he's raising up the David's to go and release the sound. He's raising up the Isaiah's, those that are willing to go where God tells them to go. And he's releasing it to where we're going to bring change to nations. 
He's raising up the people that will get before him and cry out, that will labor and travail and push back their place, that want to be in an intimate place. And Lord God, how can I reach your people? Because we have the heart of God, because we've been in relationship. And according to Jeremiah 33 and 3, he's now revealing to us things that we don't know, but things that has now become a part of who we are, because we now have a deeper part of God's heart in us that is now causing us to be provoked to our purpose and our destiny. But we don't get there without intimacy. God will give you strength to stand in everything and against everyone that's coming against you. He will give you a strategy that will come against everything that is sent to demoralize, to humiliate, and to discriminate against you. God will give you strategies and war plans that will level the playing field like an atomic bomb that was released over Japan. God has the ability to take those things that are operating now against you and make it operate to bless you. God is the God that was able to change everything, but it's all according to our faith. And we can't develop our faith if we don't develop an intimate relationship with God. And how do we do that? We have to be like James 4 and 10 says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. So if you are in a low place, I declare and decree right now in the name of Jesus that you will lift yourself up through humbling yourself, that you will repent. See, be like David that recognize that God, the cause and the purpose of God. Everything that we fight against is for the cause and the purpose that God sent us. We represent God. We represent his people. It's time for the church to step up and step out of the hiding and step up and speak out about the injustices that is being done in this world. To speak up and speak out against the release of sinful and abominations that is in, being done in our churches, in our homes, in our communities, in our schools. It's time for the body of believers to come together on one accord and get into the mode of fasting and praying and get to healing and deliverance. We got to return to the posture of having a heart for God, having a heart of God. It's time for us to hold each other accountable to the kingdom standards and begin to discipline others through love to help them come into the power of understanding and agreement and that the strongholds and bondage of ungodly abominations will no longer be their portion. It's time for us as believers to stand together in prayer and put prayer back into the schools in the same way as these occultic practices have gotten different types of groupings in the school. We as believers and Christians that have children in the school need to be fighting for Christian clubs to be in the school to counteract everything that's been released in their environment. <clears throat> We war so much against the secular things in the natural that we forgot about our power, the war in the spirit. Or we know about how to war in the spirit, and because we know that we have been complacent with our studying to show ourselves to approve, and we have not been in the presence of God, we know that we have no power, so why even get into the fight? That's a coward. We need to develop a deeper intimate relationship with God that will reflect and bring about a response like David. See, when the enemy provoked him, he provoked him to his purpose. It doesn't matter how big you are, how small you are. God has equipped you to silence the enemies and the Goliaths in your life. He's given you the weapons of your warfare through prayer, through fasting, the power of agreement. These are the keys to open up the doors to allow the angelic host to come in and operate and maneuver on your behalf. The only thing you have to do is walk by faith and not by sight. To continue to walk a lifestyle of obedience and those things that are uncommon to man will become so common to you that you will operate in the supernatural and no longer operate in the natural and the things that have been hindering you will shift to the things that begin to bless you. But our intimacy with God, 
It will cause us to stand boldly. It will cause us to become spiritually indignant. It will cause us to look at the principalities and say, okay, as the enemy is whispering in your ear, telling you that the storm is there, we will stand up in boldness and say, peace be still. Because we understand the power of the Spirit of God that's operating in our life. And those things that were against us, we will not see them anymore. Just like the principalities, we won't see them anymore. The, uh, the Pharisees, we won't see those anymore. The Pharaoh that came after it because God is going to open up the Red Sea and it caused it to swallow up behind us after he has given us our exodus. But as we war, you got to stay in the posture. You got to stay in a mindset and knowing that your power and your authority does not come from yourself, but it comes from the Most High God. That He has given us dominion and authority, and by the blood of Jesus and by the name of Jesus. And when we ask these things, because we're seeking you first, the kingdom of heaven, all these things will be added unto us. But if we don't seek God and we don't get into His presence, we can't form an intimacy that will release the power and authority that we need to operate, to bring change and affect change and destroy the Goliath that is trying to wreck havoc in our life. Understand this. Christ's relationship with his father is so intimate and he knew his heart, desire of the father that he elected to be sent. Just like David was sent by his father. Christ was sent by his father, our father God, to bring us comfort. See, he left the Holy Spirit behind. That is our nutritional factor, our spiritual nutrition. To help us fight and be able to sustain the warfare on the battlefield. And be able to withheld and sustain and the victory in the spiritual warfare that has been released upon us. We have all power and authority through Jesus Christ. So today, I challenge you to have a heart of David. I pray and declare and decree and release over you that you will have David's heart, that you become so intimately related with God, that anything that is spoken against the word of God, that you will have the spirit of boldness to speak up against or for the righteousness of God. That you will be so walking in your ability in the call that you have been purposed to. That others will be drawn to be healed, delivered, and set free. Because they know that the God that you serve is the true and living God. Because they see the manifestation of his glory and operation in your life. Amen. They see the manifestation of his glory in the church that you're connected to. And they see the manifestation of his love and operation by seeing you working in the fields. Not judging the people, but bringing truth, love, and light to the people. I declare and decree that you will no longer be in bondage in fear. I release the sound mind of God into your life. I release Romans 12 and 2 over you. That this mind that is in Christ Jesus also be in you. That you will have a zeal and a passion of heart. I declare and decree that the fire of God, the hunger and the thirst for God will be like never before. It can only be quenched by being in his presence. And every time you get into his presence, that that desire to give yes to grow deeper and deeper. That you find yourself constantly seeking the face of God. That you will never be outside of the will of God another day of your life. I declare that over you today. I release the peace of God. I release the healing of God. I release the anointing and the fire of God to be in operation in your life. To burn up every abomination of God out of your life. To purge you clean. And with everything that is being purged out of you, that God release a fresh oil, a fresh anointing in you that will sustain you, that will take you and take and change your mind. That just everything that's being purged for you, that it will be purged from your psyche, purged from your memory. All the negative things that has been spoken to you, telling you that you were not enough. It will no longer be your portion. But God, I am enough, and God has called me and has equipped me, and I will do the work of the Lord to the day I die. Amen. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. amen. I declare it is so. 
Be blessed. We thank you for joining us here at Life Changers International Ministry. We hope to see you soon. Hi, Stimas.